Hey guys, Dozer here bringing you a new video. Today we're going to be doing an updated version of the Prism card tier list to figure out which cards that I think are the best cards for Prism, which cards are kind of on the fringe, and which cards you probably don't want to be running in the current Everfest meta. So let's get right into it. Starting off here, we've got Arcanite Skullcap. Arcanite Skullcap is a very good equipment that gives you access to block with its battle worn ability and occasional arcane barrier. The thing about Skullcap is that you have to run this instead of other options, which is the main reason why you wouldn't run Skullcap in every matchup. The Halo of Illumination, for instance, is one of the best headpieces for Prism to run because of its ability to fill her soul and turn on her explosive plays with Toman Divinity, among other things. Arcanite Skullcap, therefore, is definitely a card that is up for consideration. I don't think that it is a mandatory card by any means. I think you can definitely do great in any event without it. However, it does give you that flexibility as a one of in your sideboard to be able to make some matchups a little better by being able to block a bit more damage when you're not expecting to get a lot of value out of your Halo. Moving on, we've got Null Rune Gloves. This card is also going to fall under consideration because it is a good card, but it now faces competition from the Crown of Reflection. The Null Rune Gloves are a good access to Arcane Barrier 1, which helps against Rune Blades mainly. But because of its ability to compete with the Crown of Reflection and the other options that we now have, it's not the guaranteed must-run card that it used to be. Moving on, we've got Command and Conquer, which definitely falls under the Consideration tab. I personally am not a fan of Command and Conquer in Prism because of its lack of synergy with the hero. Command and Conquer tends to get most of its value from when it attacks for a breakpoint, such as 7 or higher, or when it's pummeled with an attack reaction because of its ability to turn off defense reactions on the chain that it's attacking. Because Command and Conquer can do this, having those attack tricks and buffs allows it to get over those two card blocks to be able to threaten the arsenal a bit easier. Chain, Bravo, and such can use it to great effect for that reason. In the mirror matchup for Prism, Command and Conquer is okay. It pops phantasms that are not named Herald of Triumph, and while it allows you to threaten the arsenal, Prism can often get her cards out of Arsenal pretty easily because they are instants. So Command and Conquer tends to not give you full value against Prism in the mirror, and as Prism, while it can threaten Arsenal, it's very easy to block because Prism doesn't have a lot of options to buff the card. Therefore, Command and Conquer for me is going to sit in the consideration tab. You can definitely run it, and it'll definitely give you some good moments, but I personally don't think it's very consistent, and because it's not a light card, because it's not yellow or blue, you're going to really struggle with resources sometimes, and that's just something that I cannot justify running at this time. Pursuit of Knowledge is going to be under potential. I think Pursuit of Knowledge is a really cool card. I made an entire video talking about the possibilities that Pursuit of Knowledge can give to you, but I think because of its low damage, its overall low block, and its low synergy with what Prism is trying to do, I don't currently think that Pursuit of Knowledge is really worth running because the meta is too fast. I think it doesn't help you against decks like Viserai or Starvo because it's just not enough threat, and I think there are better options to run currently. Chains of Eminence, I'm going to put this under a don't run. Chains of Eminence is a tech card that doesn't really do what it's supposed to do. Um, it's potentially useful, but the problem with it is that a lot of the time when you play it, it doesn't actually do anything for you, and there's no way to guarantee that it does give you value, even when you have something like a Phantasmoclasm to reveal your opponent's hand. In a super, super slow matchup, maybe you can combine this with the Potion of Seeing or whatever the one that lets you reveal your opponent's hand is, but otherwise I'm not really big on this card and I don't think it finds a place because it only lasts for one turn and is a red card that takes up a slot in your deck. Moving on, Plunder Run is banned. We no longer have to talk about this card. Uh, push the point. I think we're going to run this under Don't Run This. Um, it's not reliable enough to get the value off of it and Aggro Prism builds now have better cards than Push the Point to run. Fate for Scene Red, I think, can definitely go under Fringe. I think that it is a decent card. The 4-block can be very relevant in certain matchups, but the opting is not very powerful for Prism, and so I don't think uh, the Fate for Scene is going to be a must-include in any Prism list. I think it's one of the least performing cards that you can find competitive success with, and I think it's one of the first things you want to cut when you're looking at different deck lists. Moving on, we've got the yellow version, which I think has potential because of its ability to synergize with Luminaris. However, I think that it is less useful than the red, and so it'll normally be one of my first things to cut. Moving on, Whispers the Oracle. I think we're going to put this under Don't Run. 
I used to really love this card. It used to be very good in the slower meta. Well, it also gave you the ability to block it a chain and things. However, nowadays you have better cards to run in that slot, especially because we now have the blue auras out of Everfest. So no longer need to use this card, especially because setting up the triple tomes is no longer really necessary to close out a lot of matchups that are slower. And while it might come back in the future to set up certain plays, I don't think Prism gets enough value out of the opting compared to what she used to. Snag, don't run it. It doesn't really have any synergy. And even back during chain meta, it wasn't even that great. So don't run snag. I think lunging press has potential. I think being able to synergize with erudition and with your pursuit of knowledges to get those on hits through against classes like warrior or rune blade that have a lot of armor, but not necessarily a lot of phantasm pops allows you to get a lot of damage through. And it's the perfect card to combo with erudition because if you have this in the herald in your hand, you can pitch a yellow to get the erudition to attack. If they pop the erudition, you can pitch the lunging press to pay for your footsteps and then attack. So it being a blue is very relevant, especially because it fulfills both of your needed roles for erudition trying to get over those armor blocks. I think it's very good, but definitely not a... Um, well, we'll move it up to fringe. It can be useful, but it's not necessarily in a good position in the meta right now, I don't think. Moving on, Springboard Somersault, I'm going to put under Don't Run It as a yellow card that blocks two from hand. You have a lot of better options to run, and you have better things to put in your arsenal, so I don't think it's worth running. Crown of Reflection is definitely under considerations. I think that giving access to Arcane Barrier is really useful, but the problem with Crown of Reflection is that the active ability is very, very hard to use. It's very rare that you actually want to kill one of your own auras to put another aura into play on your own turn. And so Crown of Reflection, while it can help you close out a game as a last resort, it's mostly just going to be a Arcane Barrier that frees up your hand slot. So that's a little bit better than Null Rune Hood, right? And so because Prism's getting access to more and more good gauntlet pieces, being able to consolidate and cut down how many equipments you're running is going to give Crown of Reflection a consideration rating because you'll be able to find some lists that want to maximize their main deck space. And so Crown of Reflection will cover multiple options and help you do that. So we've got now Fractal Replication. I think Fractal Replication is a core card for Prism. It is a zero cost attack that copies the stats and effects of all the Phantasm cards on the chain. And that's just really strong. Uh, because of that, Fractal Replication is going to be a core card for me because even in a mirror matchup or even as a normal card, you'll normally be able to at least block for three with it. And it never really gets stuck in Arsenal or things like that because it's a zero cost attack and gets go again from Luminaris, which means that if you've got a bunch of Spectral Shields and you've got this thing stuck in your Arsenal and you maybe want to Arsenal a defense reaction, you can just attack with this for zero and get it out of there and move on about your day. So I think Fractal Replication is an amazing card, and while it can be clunky, I think that as you learn how to play around it, it just gets better and better. So I definitely think it is worth running in a lot, if not most, Prism lists. Mirage Metamorph is also going to fall under Core. It is an amazing card. It threatens both the cheap Phantasm aggro game plan as well as the Aura game plan by being able to copy your Auras. So Mirage Metamorph, guaranteed Core card for Prism. Super great. Shimmers of Silver, also Core. The ability to go unchecked for a number of turns to get an increasing number of damage tokens onto your Auras makes Shimmers of Silver extremely valuable. And the fact that it is an effectively must-remove card for your opponent means that it can really slow down slowed matchups like Guardian and can also give a lot of trouble to other Illusionists or even against your Rune Blades because if they leave this alone, you'll be able to chip them down over the course of the game. Core card. Uh, Haze Bending is also a core card. However, Haze Bending is a bit more situational. Haze Bending is a very good card, being able to replace itself or the other non-token auras that you control with Spectral Shield tokens as your opponent destroys them. So in certain matchups where you want to have a lot of good auras down, Haze Bending is a great way to recoup some of the cost of them breaking those so that you can keep attacking and keep healing up to slow the game down to get value. Haze Bending, therefore, is a core card. I think Passing Mirage is also a core card. It eliminates one of the biggest weaknesses of the Illusionist class, that being Phantasm. Passing Mirage, therefore, is a zero-cost card that on average will absorb about four damage from the heroes in the game, allows you to without any worry, throw your first Phantasm at your opponent. They can't pop it. They have to deal with it, honestly. And it is very good into matchups that are not only likely to pop your Phantasms, but even into matchups that are not likely to, because it's that extra little bit of insurance to guarantee that you can pressure your opponent on the front foot. Passing Mirage is therefore core. I would then say that, passing, uh, that Piercing Reality here 
Pierce Reality is going to go under Fringe. I think Pierce Reality is a good card. It does a lot of things well, but the thing is, is that Prism currently does not have a lot of value from it because you struggle to not only keep this out long enough to get value off of it, but also to have enough cards in hand to then get value off of it. The thing about Passing Mirage is that you always know that your opponent will not be able to pop your Phantasm, whereas if I play Pierce Reality and I attack with a Wartoon Herald, my opponent may be able to pop it, negating the entire value of that card. So Pierce Reality, therefore, has the biggest amount of counterplay because of its reliance on Phantasm to work, and I think that while it feels great to resolve a 7-attack dominated air dish with no Phantasm, Pierce Reality is probably the weakest of the auras and one of the first ones that I cut. Therefore, it's under Fringe because it's still playable, but it's not necessarily an auto-include by any means or one of the you know last cards that you cut. It's definitely one of the first. Then we've got Coalescence Mirage. I think Coalescence Mirage is currently going to sit under Potential because it's just strictly a worse Herald that gives you an upside when it's popped, but a lot of those upsides would have been better off being gained from just arsenaling that blue aura or from playing it by paying for your footsteps. So I think Coalescence Mirage is not threatening enough or um, it's, on, it's on pop effect is not really debilitating enough for your opponent, unlike the Mirage Metamorph. So I think it is a potentially good card in the future, but for right now with the current card pool, it's been underwhelming and I would not be running it anytime soon. Phantasmal Haze, however, is going to go under Don't Run This Card. It is simply too expensive for what it does. It only gives you one Spectral Shield if it's popped and costs three resources to attack for eight. There are better aggressive options for Prism, that are better Illusionist attacks for Prism, period, and the downside of them popping this is so low that unless we get something that allows us to duplicate these effects, it's not going to find play anytime soon. It is strictly underpowered. The Veiled Intentions is also going to go under Don't Run This Card. It doesn't do enough. If you're going to go all in on buffing your Phantasms, you need to get the maximum payoff. Phantasmify does this. While you get a slight uptick in damage from Veiled Intentions by it giving you four damage for one resource as a red and so on, it only gives you the downside for your opponent of them. If they pop it, then they give you the um, they give you the card draw, but that's not really that useful for Prism because if you're paying a resource and a card to potentially get a card back if they pop it, you've spent two cards and resources, so three cards to get one card back. So you've gone down two cards and your opponent's gone down one card. That's not a good trade for you. And so I think Veiled Intentions is simply not worth running. Just, it's, if you're going to run that, you're going to run Phantasmify. And if you're going to run Veiled Intentions as well as that, you're basically just playing Blitz and trying to race. I think Talisman of Recompense has potential. I think its ability to synergize with Red Heralds with Vestige is very interesting. And I think that in a metagame where the Red Heralds are able to find a space in a deck list, the Talisman of Recompense is going to be very good for you. However, I think that it is too clunky to make use of, and I think there are better cards for Prism to run. Therefore, it's going to go in the potential category. Talisman of Tides is going to go under Fringe. I think it is a potentially good card to combo with things like Phantasmoclasm or to go into very specific matchups as a counter card, such as Bravo Star of the Show, to jam up their Crown of Seeds to deny their Triple Fuse ability a bit more often. But I think that Talisman of Tides is a do-nothing card that doesn't really have any synergy with the deck naturally. And so while it could be very cute and it could do a lot of good things for you, I think there are probably better cards that you'll want to run first before you run Talisman of Tides. Library of Solana, I think personally is a fringe card. Everyone should know it by this point that I'm not a big fan of Library. I think it is very underwhelming and I think that any game that you won with Library, you probably could have won without it. Library depends on a lot of things to work and it's also a one of, so you can't even plan on drawing it at the time of the game that you need it. Therefore, I think while Library can win you some games, it'll probably lose you just as many, if not more, games. And so I don't recommend running Library unless you just have the card and really want to run it because all in all, it's a one-of. It's not going to change a lot of your matchups except for those times where it does and loses you the game. So, you know, keep that to your own um, opinion there and, you know, see what you like to run. I, I'm not going to stop you. Uh, Luminaris, however, is definitely the core weapon for Prism. It's the best. It gives you everything you could want. Iris of Reality sucks for Prism currently, and Luminaris is just fantastic. So definitely going to be our core weapon there. Erudition is also going to be one of the core cards for Prism. It is her bread and butter. It's the scariest card in her deck. 
even though we don't get to hit with it very often, it's very, very scary and is definitely an auto-include in any prism list. Going forward, I also think that Arclight Sentinel is going to fall in that category of a core card as well. It's a great card. It's a fundamental specialization for Prism. It gives her a lot of flexibility and options to control the pace of the game, and it is a fantastic card, definitely a core card. Genesis is also going to fall under that category because of its ability to snowball the game out of control in the Prism's favor, and I think that Genesis, especially combined with some of the other cards that we'll be talking about, is a key card for Prism, and you'll definitely want to be considering running it in any Prism list. I definitely think it is one of the last cards that you cut. Herald Judgment, however, is a consideration card. I think it's very good into metas that are very heavy based on Katsu, Dorinthia, Kano, etc. because it threatens to turn off their special abilities. However, I don't think it is a core card for Prism because in most matchups it won't really do anything. So I think that it is a fine card, but it's definitely not one of those first auto-include cards in every list. Then we have Herald of Triumph. I'm going to put Herald of Triumph under considerations. I think if your meta is full of a lot of brutes, you definitely want to run Herald of Triumph to be able to force through some damage. The only problem with Herald of Triumph is that brute's not really that popular right now or that strong, and so if you're running these cards to be ready for a very rare matchup that you can win with other means, I think it's not the best card for Prism because you just have better options that give you more of a return on your investment, especially now that we have access to Passing Mirage. Passing Mirage reducing the Phantasm weakness of the deck means that Triumph is not as necessary anymore to force through damage when we get that card out. So, moving forward, we've got Parable of Humility, which I will put under Fringe. I think as much as I've tested it, as much as I've liked and gone back and forth on the card, it's just not very useful. It costs a lot to put it into play, it takes a long time for it to be worth the same as the cards that you paid to play it, and I think that Parable of Humility, while there are high times and low times with the card. I think overall, it is one of the first cards I'm going to cut in order to make space for better cards. Moving on, we've got Merciful Retribution, which is a core card for Prism. The amount of games I've won off of this card is probably close to 70% of the games that I've played with this deck and this hero. I think Merciful Retribution is one of the last cards that you cut. I've always run three of this card. It is amazing. Moving on, we've got Ode to Wrath, which is also a core card. However, I'm kind of back and forth on ratios and kind of how to use it. I think as you get better at using the card and playing the deck over time, Ode Wrath becomes a much better card. And I think that Ode Wrath is definitely a core card for Prism and comprises the core seven now auras that Prism likes to run because they are just really, really strong. I think Herald of Protection Red is a consideration in an aggro matchup where you can afford to run these cards but I think the yellows and blues are core cards. Yellow and blue protection are probably the highest value heralds in the game, and I think that having the synergy with your Vestige and your Luminaris makes them the better picks over the reds in almost every case. For Ravages, we're gonna put Ravages under the fringe category. Ravages is a very low value herald where it just does a little bit of extra damage if it hits. While the blue Ravages can be very useful, I don't think that going forward the blue Ravages are really necessary because of all the new blues that Prism is incentivized to run, those being the new blue Auras. Because of that, I think Ravages is going to take a backseat to some of the other cards. However, there might be a time where you run, want to run a lot more Heralds, and so Ravages will probably be one of the better Heralds that you can be running. Moving on, we've got Herald of Rebirth. Herald of Rebirth Red will put under consideration because again, in an aggro matchup, maybe you want to run it. However, the yellows and blues are definitely some of the all-stars in any Prism list. Being able to recuperate all of your Phantasm cards over the course of the game, while also synergizing with Luminaris, Genesis, and Vestige, makes Herald of Rebirth one of the best Heralds at giving you flexibility, as well as giving a threatening on hit that makes your opponents think twice about letting it hit. Moving on, we've got Herald of Tenacity, which is also going to go under Fringe. I think Herald of Tenacity in every color is probably the worst Herald in the game. And while it could be useful if you're trying to hit a certain density of cards for Genesis and Vestige and such, I think that Tenacity does not make the cut in most matchups or more, most deck lists. And maybe in the future, when we have more of an aggressive game plan, the Dominate might be useful. But until then, right now, it is currently relegated to the Fringe category. Wartoon Herald, on the other hand, is definitely going to be a yellow and blue staple with core, with the red again falling into considerations. The yellow and blues again synergize with your equipments and your game plan, while the reds allow you to pressure a bit more by threatening a bit more damage at the cost of synergy with your other elements of your deck. Moving on, we've got Vestige of Soul, which I'm going to put in the core uh, category here. 
Vestige of Soul is incredible. It allows you to threaten more plays than anything else in the game in that chest slot and lets you synergize with not only your Merciful, but also with your Heralds hitting, your Talo of Illumination, and your Tomes of Divinity. It's an amazing card and enables you to do so much. Vestige is definitely core. Halo also is going to be core because it allows you to, again, combo with your Vestige, turn on all your different effects, and fill your soul to help get you that late game push that you might need when otherwise you might have been running Skullcap to block some damage. You can use Halo to stop some damage with your Spectral Shields, reducing damage while also attacking. It's a very high value card. Celestial Cataclysm is also going to be core for Prism. It's a key card in the Prism Mirror match while also being a key card in allowing you to threaten certain decks when you have a lot of soul saved up to just push more damage and try and aggro your opponent down. 7 for 0 go again is pretty strong, especially as a light yellow card, 7 block that also has 3 defense. It's fantastic. Soul Shield is also going to be core because of its ability to synergize with Vestige, your other cards, as well as being able to pitch and save a lot of resources, getting soul for your Spectral Shields. Soul Shield's amazing. Soul Food is going to have potential, I think, if Prism ever gets access to more cards that pay off from having lots of soul, Soul Food could be a consideration, however, at the moment it is currently kind of useless. Tome of Divinity, however, is a core card because of its ability to give Prism access to explosive turns and plays. Tome of Divinity is definitely one of the best cards that you can run for Prism, as it is one of the key reasons you'll be able to come back in otherwise very difficult games. I think Invigorating Light is going to be under Don't category, it's simply too low value, and its lack of reliability of going to soul is a big weakness. If this card always went to soul, you might actually run it, but since it doesn't, we don't worry about it. Glisten, I think, has fringe use. I think all the colors, except for blue, um, are probably worth running, because in a slow metagame where they don't have very unpredictable damage, such as Oldheim or Dash or things like that, Glisten can give you a lot of value over time and really give you an easy win into a lot of heroes. The problem with it is that it is matchup specific and it is kind of hard to fit into a lot of matchups. And because of that lack of flexibility, it's one of the first cards that you can cut because you don't need it to win those slow matchups. Moving on, we've got Illuminate, which is going to be under the Don't category. Its lack of Go Again and its lack of the Illusionist category means that it doesn't synergize well enough with your Genesis or synergize well enough with the rest of your deck for it to be worth really running. I think Illuminate is you know, not a terrible card, but it's not something that you want to bend over backwards to fit into your deck, nor do I think it beats out any of the other, op of the other options. We've got, um, I always forget the name of this card because it's so terrible. In the chain meta, it was sort of playable as a defensive light card, but in the current meta game, it's not even worth running it at all, and I think we will simply put it down here. Um, don't run that card. I literally don't even remember the name because I don't play it ever. Rising Solar Tide is also going to fall under Don't. It's simply a low value card that goes to Soul on Hit, and we have better things to be playing than that, even though it doesn't have Phantasm. In the matchups that are going to be popping your Phantasm, a 5 attack card that goes to Soul is not really threatening anything, so I wouldn't worry about running that card. Seek Enlightenment is going to be the same sort of problem, where all of our Heralds already go to Soul, so we don't need to be running this card, and giving more attack damage onto our Phantasms that are going to get popped. It's kind of just wasted value. Blinding Beam is under the potential category. I think this card could see play in various metas. It definitely has its uses in the Bolton matchups, in matchups that have low attack Phantasm breaking cards, such as Brute or even Runeblade. The only problem is, is that it's kind of hard to fit in your deck list and very situational on when you can use it. So while it has potential, I don't think it's going to be one of the cards you're really looking to put into your Prism deck, unless you have a very specific meta call that you're trying to make. Uh, Ray of Hope is also going to go under Don't Run It. It's a low-value card. doesn't really work. Don't run it. Iris of Reality, also Don't Run It. It, you know, I wish it worked. It's very pretty, but it does not work, and it's not worth running. Moving on, we've got Phantasmal Footsteps, which is going to go under Core. Being able to get your action point back after you have your Phantasm broken is very, very good. And you're also able to pay one resource to give it one defense for the entire turn. So if your opponent's closing the combat chain a lot, such as with Chain or Dash, it can block a lot of damage for you. Core card. Dreamweavers, I think, is going to go under consideration. I think it's useful, but a lot of matchups, you don't even need this card. So I think that unless you have a very specific reason for running it, the card that is going to give you this unknown amount of value, that being Dreamweavers, is not necessarily worth running over other options. Moving on, we've got our Phantasmoclasm, which I'm going to put under Core. 
a nine attack phantasm that helps you look at your opponent's hand and mess up their next turn is incredibly valuable it's always felt good to resolve this card and now with the addition of fractal into the mix it combos very well with all these things and gives you more targets so phantasmoclasm is still in the core category of being a great card for prism moving on Red Prismatic Shield is definitely a core card, while the yellow version is going to go under Consideration, and the blue is going to go under Don't Run. The main reason for this is that the red version creates three shields, the yellow two, and the blue one. They all cost three, so the blue is too expensive to be worth running. The yellow could be worth running because of its synergy with Luminaris, as well as its ability to close out late game situations by creating extra tokens to ping wide without having soul. However, the red version is definitely a core card that you're need to won't run in most of your matchups because of its ability to go wide set up your value with merciful and ode to wrath as well as to do well in the mirror because the spectral shields in the mirror are very important to manage so this is one of the best cards at doing that going forward we've got phantasmify which i'm going to put under uh, potential i think that phantasmify at least the yellow and red and maybe the blue whatever you know there will probably be a time in the future where illusionists can just go really tall the problem with this card is that it simply makes you bet on your opponent not having a phantasm breaking card or for you to combo this specifically with your dreamweavers this card is much better in blitz than it is in cc because that damage matters a lot more in blitz so i think that phantasmify is interesting but it is simply not worth running in cc at the moment because of the lack of payoff for getting it to work moving on we've got enigma chimera red yellow and blue I personally think that the red and the yellows are under consideration and the blue is under potential. I think the red and yellows have a lot of synergy with Prism, being able to slot in as aggressive options to synergize with your fractal replication. I think that Enigma Chimera, red and yellow, being able to synergize not only with your Luminaris, but also being able to attack for eight damage for two resources is very, very powerful. I think it's worth running for sure. And in meta, uh, meta games where you actually are allowed to attack and be aggro where your aura matchup doesn't quite do it. I think that um, you're able to make use of it, but it's not always going to work for you. It's going to depend on your meta. I think going beyond that, we've got Spears of Surreality, which I think has potential. The reds and yellows, not really the blues though. I think that the red and yellow um, Spears of Surreality allows you to run a less yellow focused prism build, but at the same time, it's a low value card that has the potential to get broken and it doesn't threaten really any on hits. So if you're trying to play this card in Constructed, specifically CC, I don't think that it's currently going to make the cut, even though in the future it might be the perfect card to slot in with all the new Illusionist cards that we hope to get in the next couple years. Going beyond that, Ironhide Gauntlet. While I used to think this card was not super great, I now think it fits under the core category for Prism. In most matchups, in the hand slot, Prism just doesn't get a lot of value. Goliath Gauntlet is risky, Dreamweavers is potentially zero value, and Null Ring Gloves, while good in some matchups, is not always going to be useful against most heroes. Ironhide Gauntlets, on the other hand, are always useful. Prism's always floating extra resources on her turn, or has the ability to float resources to pay for her various effects, such as Footsteps or her Hero Power. And being able to use one resource to block an additional two damage can be just the right thing that you need to be able to block really important attacks. Namely, you can use it to pay for a soul shield with a blue, use iron high to stop a crippling crush crush effect by blocking eight with a single card and a pitch from hand. Therefore, I think iron high gauntlet works in every matchup and is now one of the cards I'm most excited to run with prism, especially in the new matchups such as uh, Starvo or Visarai, where they have a lot of attack damage coming through and being able to pay and stop that is very, very useful. Moving on, we've got exude confidence. I'm going to say this is a don't run card. It doesn't really have synergy with what Prism's trying to do. And, you know, it's just not really that impactful right now. So maybe it has potential, but I'm not really big on it. Nourish Emptiness, also not big on that card. It doesn't really do anything for Prism. And she runs so many attack actions that the effect will effectively never be turned on. Captain's Call, I think you don't really want to run it either. You know, maybe there's a build of Prism one day that likes to run that. But I don't think it's really worth running over other cards that she has access to. Hope Merchant's Hood... Heart and Cross Strap uh, are going to go under there as well. The Goliath Gauntlet could be useful as a fringe card. I still think that Ironhide is probably better in most cases because of the ability to deny on hits rather than giving you that plus two on your Erudition. Because your Erudition, while seven attack dominate is kind of hard to block for a lot of characters such as Ranger or Ninja, all it effectively means is you're forcing through one Erudition and um, 
it's just that can be the make or break in some matchups but otherwise i'm not really big on the card beyond that enlightened strike i think has fringe usefulness it has anti-synergy with prisms luminaris however the ability to attack for seven with no phantasm or the ability to attack for five with go again or to draw a card you know all these things are very useful and so it's definitely a playable card but i think personally that it has a lot of anti-synergy with what prism's trying to do and it's not one of the first things i'm trying to put into the deck i think toma findall also is going to go under consideration along with time snap potion because of their ability to synergize and reward prism for not blocking a lot of the decks currently in the metagame don't like to block and so prism not being able to really stop their damage with her instance and two block auras means that if prism is able to synergize with these cards like time snap potion which helps her, which helps her get her blue auras into play easier it means that toma find all gets a lot better to be able to heal have a bigger hand and attack back at your opponent beyond that we've got remembrance which i think has uh, place as a consideration i think if you're worried about getting decked out remembrance is really useful however currently in slow decks prism's not really having to worry about that so i'm not really worried about running remembrance anytime soon especially because it can mess up your pitch stack which is normally very important for late game prism energy potion i think is a consideration as well i really like energy potion in a halo vestige list especially with its ability to make your tome divinity plays that much more impactful however currently it is one of the cards that I'm having trouble fitting into my lists. And so while you might find space for it in your own list, I think it does compete with other things and you might not want to be running it, especially now that we have these zero cost auras that are also blues that allow you to get a lot more advantage off of your last action point than Energy Potion does. Moving beyond that, we've got Sigil of Solace, which is definitely a consideration card. Healing three is not ever a bad thing and its ability to help you prolong the game allows you to potentially outvalue your opponent with your value generating tools like your auras raging onslaught red and yellow i think are definitely considerations i don't think they're auto includes by any means the prism mirror is going to become very interesting with Ractal and all these new cards because while on one hand you need to be able to pop phantasms at the other time your opponent might not be giving you phantasms to pop maybe they're playing a full aura list where they're trying to spam as many auras as possible maybe they're trying to put out their passing mirage in order to remove phantasm from their first attack on the turn making your raging onslaught effectively a dead card you know a lot of these times the card doesn't get a lot of value and even though it can help you in the mirror a lot it can also clog your hand and not be that great especially when they're starting to go wide with auras and start chipping you down so I think that Raging Onslaught, while could be while it could be potentially useful, I think that it is not a core card for Prism because it matters very much on how many Prisms are in your meta, as well as what style those Prisms are playing. Moving on, we've got Pummel. I'm not a big fan of Pummel. I think it goes under Fringe because it has a lot of weaknesses to the fact that if your opponent pops your Phantasm, you don't get to use it red and yellow pummels specifically blue pummel allows you to pay for your footsteps and then attack with another herald anyway but the fact that it only then comes in for two extra damage means that while it can give you some good plays with erudition here and there it is mostly a anti-synergistic very high rolly card that's very expensive for low impact so while you might want to fit one or two pummels into your deck for a late game type of play it's not a core card for Prism that you want to run in every list, nor is it a card that you can rely on every game to get you full value. Moving beyond that, we've got Razor Reflex, which is normally going to go under Don't Run. Prism doesn't have a lot of very cheap cards that want to run Razor Reflex, and so I wouldn't really worry about running that anytime soon. Unmovable Yellow, namely, is a core card for Prism in my opinion. With the rise of Starvo, I think that Reds might be worth running instead of the Yellows, but the Yellow pitch is really relevant for Prism, obviously. Having too many reds can really hurt your deck, and the unmovable yellow still blocking for seven from Arsenal is normally good enough to stop the important on hit effects, especially if you are blocking with a three from hand, a seven from Arsenal with the unmovable, and having one shield. It will cover Oak and Old that is triple fused off of Bravo ability, that being the Starvo ability, and it still gives you that potential to pitch to get your go again on a pivotal turn. So I think unmovable yellow is definitely a core card, and the red is probably a consideration. And then moving beyond that, we've got Sync Below's. I think Sync Below Red is definitely a consideration. I used to love this card. It used to be an auto-include card for me. However, I think now we have better cards to run and the block is not as relevant anymore. 
because our ability to protect our spectral shields is so low at the moment with Vizrai and Starvo in the meta that blocking a little bit of extra damage is not really worth giving up the ability to be proactive, aggressive, or synergize with our other cards. I think you can run Sync Below's and be happy with that in your deck, but me personally, I'm not very big on running the cards. And then beyond that, we've got Nimblism, which I would not say to run, because again, Prism doesn't have a lot of cheap cards that want to benefit off of that, and, you know, Plunder Run's banned. So, that was a lot of information, but I hope you're able to follow it and get my gist and my opinions on all the current cards that Prism can really run. I think that if you want to run Find All Spring Tunic, you can. It's a consideration. Personally, I think Vestige is always better because of its ability to threaten far more play lines than the Tunic can, because if I attack you with a Herald, for instance, or I have a Merciful Retribution out, you can, if you see that your opponent doesn't have a Tunic resource, effectively kill the Aura for free or let the Herald hit and not worry about your opponent popping off with a Atonement Divinity for one blue card or other plays such as that. Um, it makes a big difference for me and the explosiveness of the Vestige is very, very relevant and I would not be cutting it anytime soon. Though again, you can make a Tunic build work. That being said, I think that covers everything. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you guys in the next video. Otherwise, stay cool. Peace. Thank you for watching. This video and the videos on this channel are made possible thanks to viewers like you. I'd like to give a special shout out to all the patrons who help support the channel and make all this content possible. Starting with the Dreamweaver patrons, we have Terra Blitz. Thank you for your continued support. You rock. For the Sentinel Tears patrons, we have Bon, David Romish, Exploding Potatoes, Joe Giannoli, Michael Lynch, P13TR2U, Tim J and Todd Stewart. Thank you guys for your support. It's a pleasure working with you. Then we have a lot of new heralds to welcome into the fold. Thank you all for your support. And I can't wait to see where all the Everfest and Flesh and Blood stuff takes us. So starting with thank you to Andy Lee, Callum Bousfield, Carlos Carrero, Christopher D. Bates, Dueling Spuds, Ike Vic Hagen, Francesco Lorenzi, Henrik, Jay Keatsos, Jake Arms, Jake Bennett Dwyer, Joel Wilhelm, John and Downing Jr., Jonathan Pohl, Michael Stowell, Moonshaker, Musrack Tuck, Raymond Scott, Richard N., T.Y. Craig, Valentine N., Will Fry, and Zombie Z. Thank you all for your support, and let's not forget the Spectral Shields, Andrew Good, Bryce Morgan, Drew Wagers, Rachel, and Sarazar. Thanks to all of the patrons for your support, each and every one of you makes this all possible, and I couldn't do it without you. Thanks, everybody, and take care.